That's right, I'm talking about three episodes in one video because these three episodes are kind of similarly produced and I don't want to spend like an hour on each of these episodes, though they do deserve it, but I want to move on from Jujutsu Guys and I want to make different content, goddammit. So I'll just talk about the production of all three of these episodes in one video and also just break down the highlights of all three of these episodes. So how is it? Simply put, it is incredible. For all three of these episodes, this level of quality at this stage of any production would be incredible, but JJK season 2 is not like any other production. This is the most fucked up production that a high profile anime has ever seen. This beats out One Direct Priority. I thought nothing would ever beat out One Direct Priority. In terms of production schedule, it is worse than that. JJK of course makes up for that by throwing a ridiculous amount of manpower into the project. One Direct Priority could not afford that. All three of these episodes have a terrible production but are incredibly well produced and that yes that's an oxymoron and it works for most Jujutsu Kaisen episodes honestly. In terms of completion yes they do gradually go down 19 is the most complete episode 20 has a little bit lesser polish and episode 21 has even lesser polish but still all three of these episodes they have some level of the artistic vision still being shown. Like in these three episodes you can actually see the quirks of the director unlike the episode that came before that is episode 18 by Shota Goshizono which looks pretty much nothing like a Shota Goshizono episode and also that episode being a sacrificial lamb is definitely what allowed all three of these episodes to be such an amazing product. Not in terms of manpower of course, it had amazing highlights by Daniel Kim and Takafumi Mitani. It had very cool anime original ideas like the claustrophobic fight scene and the elevator fight scene. At the end of the day, even though it is the worst Gosto episode, it is still a Gosto episode. The sacrifice is not in terms of manpower, it's in terms of production time management. After that episode, Gosto appeared as an animator in both episode 20 and 21. In 21, he animated a really good scene and in 20, he animated the best scene of the episode. Obviously, he's doing that parallelly while storyboarding and directing episode 18. Not only did he sacrifice his own episode, he still helped out and animated the highlights in the upcoming episode. Because at the end of the day, he's not a highlight episode director anymore, he is the series director and he's doing absolute justice to that role. Apart from that, the main reason that episode 19 was so polished also has to do with the content that's being adapted. The first half is a lot more demanding in terms of action animation and that was just carried by Yoto and Kosuke Kato animating one and a half minutes and one minute of content each. Whereas the rest of the episode is pretty much just a flashback with chibi designs still elevated by Miyajima's amazing direction, but it doesn't change the fact that it's content that's much easier to adapt compared to what came in the first half and also what comes in the following two episodes because the next two episodes are full action. As for the staff list of this episode, yes, now Miyajima is back. He directed an extraordinary episode in Hidden Inventory Arc that stood toe to toe with the next episode which was supposed to be the highlight and even surpassed it in terms of action animation. And making an episode that's on par with Arifumi Imai's episode when it's your first time directing an episode yeah, Miyajima is a talented individual. This is the second episode that he's directed. His direction chops show so well. He's an amazing action animator. Obviously, most of that action animation talent is going to translate to his action storyboards as well. He did have help in terms of direction as well. And these are Jujutsu Kaisen regulars. Kosuke Kato, he's the main animator, but this is the first time he directed for this project. And also Atsushi Nakagawa, who has been the most important assist director. Atsushi Nakagawa has been the assistant episode director in six episodes and been the main episode director for two episodes. We also have a new New Jujutsu Kaisen staff joining in. This is Shotaro Tamemizu. It's his first time working on the project and he also assisted as the episode director. Looking at his past works, Tamemizu is an incredible animator. He does action animation really really well. As for the animation director, of course every single one of these episodes there are way too many to mention. So I'll just talk about the chief animation directors and some of the animation directors who stood out in particular. So for this episode, the chief animation director was Reina Igawa. Igawa was also the CAD for the previous Miyajima episode. Apart from that, Igawa has also been insanely important to the project as a whole but that again is the case with most members in Jujutsu Kaisen. Talking about the individual components of this episode again it's wonderful. The animation as I said spectacular. The character supervision is also great. The art direction is particularly amazing. One of the best episodes of the show in terms of art direction and the compositing is also peak Jujutsu Kaisen. Really the only thing that even stood out as bad it might be this Nobara walk cycle towards the beginning of the episode but that's just the biggest fucking nitpick ever and can be easily ignored in an episode that is 90% polished. Let's talk about the next episode, episode 20. This is a top 3 Jujutsu Kaisen episode for me. It's just that good in terms of content. In terms of the animation, again it could have been the best Jujutsu Kaisen episode. Even better than episode 16 if it was also cooked 
as well as episode 16 was, which unfortunately it wasn't. Talking about the director, we have Yuji Tokuno, who breaks the norm of debut Kaisen. Tokuno is a seasoned episode director. He's done a lot of work in the industry. He also had far less help in terms of assistant animation directors. The only assistant animation director was once again Nakagawa, but at this point, it's like tradition for Nakagawa to be an episode director, I guess. When I say that this episode is better than episode 21, most people just say that you only like fluid animation. We like good on-model animation. Are we watching the same episode? Because this episode has some of the best character supervision in the whole show. We had Yuki Kikuchi on the opener with some of the best UG drawings. We had Shun as the animation director for Light Hunt's segment in the middle, which is easily the best scene in the entire show in terms of visuals. And we also had Sota Yamazaki towards the end. I will be talking more about Sota Yamazaki. We even had Manabu Akita joining in with some corrections. I think he did this one. I'm not sure. Not confirmed yet. But the biggest shock of all is that Tadashi Hiramatsu returned. Now he didn't do a lot of work, but the fact that he returned at all is so amazing to see. It's so cool. Breaking down the individual components, again, it's amazing. It's extraordinary. The action animation did struggle towards the middle, but overall, there's so much of it and most of it being good. I really have no complaints. Now, even though the action animation could not reach its full potential, the character animation. This is a mob psycho highlight level shit. Jujutsu Kaisen has never had characters be this expressive. Dorian Kolon's animation in the beginning enhanced by Kikuchi's corrections. Lighten's animation in the middle enhanced by Shun's corrections. And Kohei Hirota's craziness in the end enhanced by Yamaso's corrections were all just the best character animation I've seen in the franchise. Peaking with Lighten's scene in the middle. Art direction and comp were again great. It was not a component that just existed and looked pretty. Tokuno made sure to use the art direction and compositing as part of the visual storytelling to sell the mood of individual scenes. Now, unfortunately, since these episodes are being finished last minute, the art direction in the episode is not perfect. There are a few backgrounds that, yeah, but overall, it's still great. And again, I have to talk about the light on segment in the middle because this is just the best scene in Jujutsu Kaisen. Fuck, I can't stop talking about this. Light on pretty much directed this entire segment as well, by the way. Tokuno gave him full creative freedom to construct the scene. And he just created this masterpiece at 24 years old. He's only one year older than me. I'm going to kill myself. Let's get to the final episode, 21. This is the finale. This is an incredible episode. It had three main animators participating. I don't think that's happened before, but one of them being Kosuke Kato only animated one very small cut in this episode. Of course, he did an insane sequence from episode 19. You really can't expect another one of that from him. The other two main animators participating being Kaito Tomiyaka and finally Heichiro Watanabe. So it was directed by Tetsuya Akutsu. As I said before, at the very beginning, this episode, it's still polished to the point where the artistic vision still shows in this episode. Tetsuya Akutsu loves you using wipes. Do we see cool wipes in this episode? Akutsu loves dynamic CGI backgrounds. Do we see that in this episode? Yes, and surprisingly good for the most part. Now, the main reason this episode looks so good is the animation director's strength. Firstly, we have Hayato Kurosaki, who has done this much work for the show. We also have Sayaka Koiso, the character designer and chief animation director of Jujutsu Kaisen Season 2. But there are also two other animation directors that I want to specifically point out, and these two are the saviors of Jujutsu Kaisen Season 2's production. There are many saviors of this production, let's be honest. But in terms of drawings, Yosuke Ajima and Sota Yamazaki. There are very few artists in general who are as good as these guys are. But add to that the fact that these guys are doing this much work in the schedule, it is unfathomable. It just means that their speed is just simply that amazing. It's like a round table of animation directors who have the ability to do so much high quality work like Kanahire Yama, Kiyo Kirikuta, Yamaso and Yajima. Unfortunately, this episode got struck with the burnt force of the schedule. While you might be personally inclined in liking this episode's visuals over the previous two, this channel is focused on objective analysis of animation. It's always kind of shitty when you have to critique things that the vast majority of people love. That said, I'm going to do it anyway. Yes, the character supervision in this episode is amazing. It's not as good as the previous episode, but I mean, very few episodes have character drawings on par with episode 20 anyway. The animation is once again, for the most part, incredible, but towards the end, that is the Yuji versus Perfected Mahito, whatever the form is called, unless it's a named animator working on these scenes, it has quite a bit of jank. Like this divergent fist scene, for example, it does not flow well whatsoever. That said, the animation and character supervision highlights more than make up for the jank in this episode. Hayato Kurosaki's corrections did save this portion quite a bit. The real issue with this episode comes with the comp and the art direction, and that's true from the very first scene. The background that they've chosen here, like this amalgamation of human thing, it, it just does not look nice. The textures are bad, and in the second half, it's even worse because of this barren land comp. These look like placeholder textures, and well, they look like that because they most likely are placeholder textures. They're skipping multiple steps of production, condensing them as much as possible into a system that makes it possible to dish out these backgrounds in like 
a few hours worth of time and that really is the case the lack of time shows a little bit in the unfinished animation but mostly shows in the art direction and compositing of this episode because those are finished maybe in like a day's worth of time it's ridiculous i'm assuming the shochi sequence towards the end had a little bit more time to cook because not only does this have some extraordinary artwork by Shoichi, but it also has perfect visual cohesion, pure harmony with the art direction and compositing, elevating Shoichi's designs. This is the visual harmony that could have existed for the whole episode, but instead we got barren backgrounds. All these problems, of course, are not even an issue for people who thought Jujutsu Kaisen Season 1's visuals were perfect, but for nerds like me, it unfortunately stands out like a sore thumb. Another thing I'm going to talk about is the management thing that people were mentioning. Like, oh, I guess it was right all along. The last few episodes are better managed which is why it looks so good. No, it's not about management. They just happen to look good. All of them are being completed the day before airing. The creators themselves don't know what the final product is going to look like when the airing date is here. Jujutsu Kaisen Season 2's production is simply a matter of who can handle sleep deprivation better. Animation is not easy. It takes a ridiculous amount of time. The Mahito beatdown scene was not just entirely done by Kosuke Kato. It was storyboarded by Naoki Mijima. Then Kosuke Kato designed the action. He made a lot of keyframes, but he couldn't do all of it. So Miyajima and Shotaro Tamemizu also helped out on a scene. Sometimes Naoki Miyajima did the original drawing, like for this one, and Kosuke Kato made the corrections on top of that. It's a very complex process, and the scene did not turn out as a masterpiece because it was well planned out by the production. No. According to Kosuke Kato, the planning for this entire sequence was done in one month and he had even lesser time for actual production of the scene. The reason this scene exists is because the incredible teamwork between Kosuke Kato, Naoki Mijima, and Shotaro Tamemizu, and also because these three had a schedule of waking each other up every three hours. Every three hours. That is why these episodes are successful, not because the last few episodes have proper planning compared to the rest. That said, let's just get into breaking down the highlights of each of these episodes. So starting with this beginning portion, the action in the beginning portion here is animated by two very young artists, Harutimu and Aditya. Harutimu animated the characters and Aditya animated the effects that's uh, later on in the scene. According to Kosuke Kato in one of his tweets, he mentioned that he also corrected some of these sequences by Harutimu. It's quite a bit difficult to tell what exactly Kosuke Kato corrected on Harutimu's segment here because looking at Harutimu's other scenes, he is a pretty timing focused animator himself. So instead of movements or completion, it could just be a character artwork corrections or these streaks of lines that Kozuke Kato has added here. But yes, as I was saying, this is quite a bit timing focused. As you can see, not a lot of keyframes. It is a lot more economical method of making animation, especially in the schedule, but it also has its own appeal. And this idea of timing focused animation is particularly embraced in this episode, I would say, because apart from this highlight, the two major highlights are also by Kanada style animators. A phenomenal layout here. The storyboard here is just so amazing. Not only does it give us an entire idea of the space, but it's also very engaging in the sense that the characters, they're coming right at the screen, right? And it's seamlessly transitioned to the next scene as well, where the characters are going away from the screen. And just look at how many people are being animated here, right? It's not just Yuji. You get this woman who's extremely well-drawn. Perspectives make the drawing much more difficult to draw. So having a character this detailed moving completely independently of Yuji over here, who's also tumbling. So even though as a result of the low keyframe animation, Yuji here is animated in threes, Harutimu also has to animate two other completely independent bodies, being this guy and this woman also in threes. So since he's animating three different bodies in threes, technically he's still animating at 24 FPS because there is literally 24 drawings for each second when you take the drawings of all three of these characters into consideration. I really like this morphing animation as well. It looks less like Mahito's forearm is transforming into spikes and more like creating spikes from inside his forearm and they are pushing its way out. The way it is timed, it makes it feel like the spikes are trying to erupt out of Mahito's skin, which is very unsettling, which is the entire point of Mahito's character. Amazing ease in into this motion, he's coming towards the camera, so he eventually has to speed up. And yeah, not only does he speed up, there's still great utilization of the environment. Use any tricks necessary to keep the audience more engaged and more invested. So instead of the side profile of a character running this way, this is a complex perspective. It's slightly top down, but also at an angle. So you're already playing with a complex shot, which is why Mahito's head and torso here looks bigger than his foot. Even with the complex perspective, he could have just ran towards the screen. But instead, what Miyajima wants you to shift your focus on is the power of the mace that he's formed in his hand. It reminds me very much of the way Yutaka Nakamura storyboards the scenes. And yes, now Miyajima's animation and storyboards in general do have a little bit of Yutapon flair to it but uh, this scene in particular the whole concept of not only having a complex layout but also having it directly engage with the viewer coming towards you is something that Utapon uses a lot and yes the effects here are animated by Aditya it looks 
really really gorgeous it's multi-shaded Aditya also animated in episode 17 where again he animated in an effects focus scene so I guess he's just an animator who likes effects animation the volume in the blood here it, it's just really well conveyed this is another exceptional shot amazing use of the 3d background again so many moving elements to this and everything has so much volume the complex perspective on Yuji yes but getting the volume across on liquid that is so incredible this guy is in front of Yuji but there's droplets and particles of blood that's ahead of Yuji or well towards the camera and it's not just these two characters and the blood that's animated frame by frame it's also these two characters in the background again they have to be animated frame by frame there's a little bit of melt expected but it's nothing to like the degree that we saw in like Chainsaw Man episode 8 for example and the shot is made even more dynamic with the usage of these wind smears that I'm assuming Aditya is still animated because he's uh, handling all the effects in the scene and yeah something as simple as effects animation on top of the camera lens it makes so much difference moving back to the no bias segment now the comp here is really good I love the colors here the scene is presumably animated by Miyajima there's a lot of scenes in this episode that's presumably animated by Miyajima because he did do a lot of layouts for this episode not just the storyboards but the layouts that is the skeleton of the animation itself similar to how Kazuto Arai and Takumi Sunakahara pretty much animated all the layouts in episode 14. Love this character acting cut for Maito here the camera comes very close to his mouth here so kind of like a Nozomu Abe-esque camera movement except it's his it's Maito's mouth instead of his eye. I also really like this when there's multiple different layers of smoke moving independently. Even though it's not really animated, it's just still layers of smoke. Now from this part, this is the Yoto sequence, but the cut that comes before this of Kugisaki shooting the nails towards Mahito, it is extremely Canada-esque, though it does not have Yoto's signature effects animation. Just look at this pose and look at the timing of that shot. So it could be rough Yoto cleaned up by someone else, or it could just be a completely different Canada style animator. I'm not sure. This is not credited in the Boru, by the way. But this cut very much needs to be in the Boru because it looks really nice. The ghosting does suck with the impact frames, as usual. The light bubbles and the Canada-esque effects animation looks really, really nice in this cut. But yes, anyway, this is the confirmed beginning of Yoto segment large movements with a few number of drawings so that right left shuffle one two and one two that's it four drawings for that entire shuffle there again the nails coming from our perspective is just so cool and the way Mahito dodges that the timing is just so satisfying on this Mahito exits the frame but the camera catches up Mahito throws all these signs look at how constricted this pose is so you're always gonna go opposites you say this is the Super Saiyan pose, right? But this pose would lose more than half of its impact if it didn't start here. This part of the Super Saiyan pose makes up more than half of this pose. So for something as simple as throwing nails, the buildup makes it far, far more satisfying. So Kugisaki is already in a nail throw pose at the beginning of this cut. You can just throw the nails like this. She is in that pose already. This is the motion that you need to do but just doing this from this neutral position is not satisfying enough. So you create anticipation. So for the build-up, since this is the motion that's happening, you go the opposite way. Kugisaki closes in her arms. And this is finally the pose that she reaches. This is as closed as her body can be. And since her body is as closed as it can be with this shot, when she opens up, the timing is just incredibly satisfying to look at. And this pose is held for a lot of frames as well. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's double anticipation here, actually. That's the first release where the hand comes close to the camera. The first release is this. And the second release is this. The screen right now, 70% of it is Kugisaki's palm. Look at the very next frame. I'm skipping one frame. Look at how different that is. So the shot is pretty much going, starting from here, all the way to here so this entire motion done in the span of one frame not even one frame it's actually zero frames right even though it's being built up for one two three four five six seven eight seven frames of build up and just one frame of release that's a snappiness this one cut of kugisaki is everything i love about kanada style animation the two things that make up the style is the poses and the timing and we get to see both of that being applied here to the absolute peak of animation by yoto i really like yoto's fx animation shapes but you see them even better over here, I think. Again, complex perspectives, really cool shots. All of these singular drawings, they look very nice. Just look at that small action there. The sweat droplet on Kugisaki's cheek here, she's just wiping it off. There's no requirement for the scene to go to slow motion with Nobara just having a monologue like, oh damn, he is so quick. And with his technique, 
He can kill me with just a single touch. Shit like that is just not required. You can convey stuff like that using just the visuals. She is struggling against a special grade and she is visibly nervous. Or that conveyed with such a small motion. Extremely cool Canada style lines here again. Look at the foreshortening in this cut. It's just so exceptional. This is just incredible. The perspective is just absolutely flawless. Combined with the snappiness of his animation, thick inky speed lines as well. This is as Canada as a shot can get, except for this. Soyoto has very unique effects animation. It is Canada derived, but it's not like a one-to-one -one replication, which is what most Canada style animators usually do. Yoto has very unique effects animation and just at a glance it's easy to tell that it's him. In classic Kannada style effects animation, you get a lot of straight lines. Yoto uses curves. So all of these are slightly curved. So it's not as geometrical as Kannada style effects usually are. Now Kimijima storyboards of course still perfection. I already talked about this shot. Transitioning into this one using nothing but impact frames over here. The momentum is carried forth not really by the animation. It's actually done using the camera movement. So the camera is being pulled back here. No, it's not a pullback. It's just a zoom out. So we start off with a very zoomed in shot and then we zoom out while also rotating the camera a little bit. So the camera rotation also works alongside the direction in which his effects animation is rotating, which is why the shot transitions so seamlessly. Yoto loves his old school designs as well, the way he's drawing Maito here. Yoto absolutely does not hide his influences. This cut, you might think it starts off as a relatively simple looking shot, but then it, look at that. Exceptional foreshortening once again. The drawings are so good. This again, I doubt it was anyone else's ideas. The idea of Nobara's nails piercing through the speech bubble. This is Studio Gainax comedy and it was definitely done by Yoto. This cut is one of the highlight cuts of this episode. It's extremely well done, dense and super super complete. So, well the movement of Nobara again with the foreshortening, amazing. The perspectives are great. The background animation is what truly carries the scene. It is absolutely exceptional the way the shading is done here. And this is a pullback. It's not a zoom out. The camera is being physically pulled back and when you do that in animation, it's doubly difficult because for a pullback, it needs to be an animated zoom out. You need to animate the background and yeah, that's why the background here is fully hand drawn by Yoto. The way he's playing with line work, the shapes here with the backgrounds, it's just so beautiful. Like the shadow of Nobara here. Very unique looking shapes. We see another homage to Yoshinori Kanada, that's a Kanada light flare. Again, incredibly well animated cut, everything here animated by Yoto. Exceptional background animation. Look at how detailed the floor is here as well. All that Miyajima storyboards keep it very engaging. It's not just a push in with the camera. You also have an out of focus nail in the foreground here. But because it's blurred, you end up naturally focusing on Mahito and the background animation. All of these drawings, I'll say once again, they're really, really good. And I wouldn't expect them to be this good in this schedule. This is another zoom out here, really well done. Zooming out, the zoom out is synchronized with the snap. Yoto's effects animation are so nice, man. Do I still need to talk about the foreshortening and the perspectives? I might sound like a broken record at this point, but yeah. Another camera pushback with all the nails, the shading on every single individual nail looks so good. Using impact frames, transition to the next scene, the cursed nails just shooting upwards. Now, I don't know if this scene, it did not make it to the Doga Man. Looks like it lacks in betweening, but hey, expected. I love this backhand as well. Another extremely cool cut with all of the principles of Canada style animation. Look at the perspective on Mahito's face here. It already starts off as complex, but then he just warps it. And the shot just carried forward with the effects animation. Look at that drawing. It looks so good. Look at that drawing. It looks so good. Look at that drawing. You get the idea. We get Mahito's POV. So Mahito is looking up here and then he's looking down, right? His gaze is slowly coming to eye level. So that's what we're seeing here. This is Mahito POV that we get to see. And if you're Mahito, this is not something that you want to see coming towards you. And that's just so well drawn. Kosuke Hato's artwork is just absolutely phenomenal. He did do some corrections in this episode as well. So yeah, Kosuke Hato takes Kanada style approach to 11. No one does it like he does it. I'll also specifically be mentioning Kosuke Kato when I eventually do make the Canada style animation breakdown as well. Look at the footwork here. So cool, so well animated. The change in the perspectives of the feet, smeared here, and then coming close to the camera, then the shuffle between the feet. Oh, so good. I would be surprised if reference wasn't used for this. I'm not saying that as a bad thing or using reference is not cheating or anything. It would only make it cooler if this was referenced honestly because that just means that he's referencing footage and using all of his animation principles to make it look so appealing and yeah uh, the flurry of blows what do we even say about this uh it, it, it's good the choreography is of course what carries the scene Kosuke Kato made one of the best choreographed scenes in this entire show and then he said I'll fucking do it again so what makes the flurry of punches here feel so strong why is this animation so good what is being done here to make the punches look so powerful, which was absent from episode 20 of the previous season, where the punches feel like they have no impact whatsoever. So Kosuke Kato was always good at drawing 
incredibly powerful punches. Look at how many frames Shimazaki is being held for before he's just thrown away into the next cut. Similar things are being applied here as well with a difference that is he can't spend too much time in anticipation, not too much time in build up and release because these are a flurry of punches, right? So what Kato is doing here is that he's making Mahito bouncy. Uh, what I mean by that is every single punch that Yuji lands on Mahito will be incredibly smeared. And look how much Yuji's fist is pushing Mahito's body inwards. That is then followed by effects animation. That's like a ripple effect. So all this inside portion, that's pretty much exaggerated. Yuji's fist is actually over here, not over here. So now once the punch is done, this is basically the pressing of the trigger in a pistol. And now everything settled down, no movement. But now the bullet needs to come out. So now again, effects animation and then boom, Mahito is just thrown away. Tons of beautiful effects on screen and look at these poses. The poses look so nice. And those techniques are applied to literally every single punch, which is why this looks so satisfying. I especially love this one, the hook to the body. This time he's smearing Yuji's entire body. It's not just the fist. Yuji's entire body is turning, which is how you punch. You don't just do a hook like this. You do a hook like this to get maximum power from your hips. Look at how far Yuji's fist is going inside Mahito over there. The impact can literally be seen on the other side. That is Yuji's fist bulging out from the other side of Mahito with more line strokes to emphasize the power. Reminds me of that Nori Matsumoto sequence from Oji Naruto vs Sasuke. It really is a different level of talent to know exactly how many drawings you need. Yuji's fist just smearing in. The impact is all the way in there, but then it just comes back, settles back. Yuji has his middle finger sticking out slightly so as to not break his knuckles when he's just pummeling Maido. That punch would obviously kill a person. Once again, it's a smeared fist coming into your screen. The connection is actually all the way here, but then it travels all the way to the other side of the screen and then comes back to a neutral position, which is the center of the screen. So while the impact is happening over here, the fist is carrying Maido's neck all the way over here and then returns to a neutral position. Again, just exactly what he's been doing for all of these punches. Yeah, I mean, all of this feels so powerful, playing with timing as well. Mahito is pretty much still in slow motion, but then we have Yuji's regular speed fist just coming into, into the screen, grabs Mahito by the hair and the collar. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, seven frames of buildup to then releases extremely chaotically. It really just keeps going whenever you feel like it's gonna stop. Uh, I love how he's making the background a little bit extra dynamic here, just by adding these simple lines. There's no background animation here. It's just a zoom out with the background, but just these lines that he's drawn on top of the background just adds some extra bit of dynamism there, which is really good. It sticks out in a really nice way as well, like the color, it's just white lines. It pops very well. All of these poses that Mahito does while tumbling towards the screen, again, just really, really wonderful. I mean, look at just this one individual drawing. Look at how perfect the perspective is here. Love this little move that Yuji does. It's so nice. It's so quirky when put into animation. And now this is full background animation and God, does it look great. It's unfortunately dimmed at the very end there. Again, uh, the layout plays a very important role here because Yuji is not actually sliding down. He's just moving straight. But by composing the shot in such a way that it looks like Yuji sliding down, that gives us a false idea of momentum. It feels like gravity is helping Yuji move forward. That fake idea gives us the sense of exaggerated speed here, which is what they're going for. A smeared face that pretty much goes back and forth and then transitions to the punch. So these frames over here, it makes it look like Yuji is fighting against something and pulling something towards Mahito. In this case, it's as easy as doing this, right? But by making it feel like Yuji struggling to pull his fist forward, Kosuke Kato is exaggerating the weight of the punches. And the impact itself, you don't really see it. It's a still frame, but you can still see that it's extremely powerful just from the effects animation, whatever you can see through the dimming and ghosting. And the way blood just squirts out of Mahito's orifices, it's just so beautiful. Another excellent cut. I mean, the whole sequence is animated by Kosuke Kato. Of course, every single cut is going to be incredible. And then we get to this beautiful drawing. I wonder who finished this. It does not look very Kozuke Kato-esque. So either one of the animation directors, but more than likely, it's just Naoki Mizima or Shotaro Tamemizu. Does not end there, of course. It's actually just beginning. Now you get to see the real non-stop rush of Yuji just throwing hands on Mahito and it's just so good. Starts with an amazing Kanada pose right here. Again, the build up to the punch is excellent. The punch itself is a still frame. The power of the punch is once again shown exclusively through the effects animation. And now we get to this. I mean, that's just unbelievable work by Kosuke. Kosuke Kato, man, it's so good. Kosuke Kato's smears are very much visible in real time as well. Like, you can very much see all the smears right here. It's not because he's using slow smears. There are other animators who actually use slow smears, even with regular motion. 
which makes their smears really visible. But Kato is not really trying to do that. It just happens because to show motion, he needs to use smears and he's not really using extra frames in the beginning of the motion or behind the motion. This is limited frame count animation after all. So most of the frames are just smeared frames, which is why the smears are so visible. The angular character designs, of course, super Canada inspired that choreography as well. Look at that, the kick to the face and then the lower kick. It's just so good. And then it just keeps going. It's genuinely incredible. And uh, it gets even more exaggerated towards the end. It keeps going more and more exaggerated. Look at Yuji's pose here. Yeah, I mean, look at that. His hand is so long over here because it's maximum exaggeration. And then we end with one of the best illustrations in all of Jujutsu Kaisen. I really mean that. Jujutsu Kaisen has some incredible animation directors, but yeah, I mean, this might be my favorite illustration in the entire show. Uh, so the layout for this was done by Naoki Mejima, but the corrections were then done by Kosuke Kato. So it's the role reverse here. Up until now, Kosuke Kato was animating with Shotaro Tamemizu and Naoki Mejima doing the corrections. What gives beauty to the scene is all of this exquisite line work and all of that it's a very easy guess to say that it's all done by Kato looking at the style of the line work. You can tell as well that it's Kato drawing on top of an already existing drawing by looking at the hair over here. The hair has its own outline and then Kato's line work with the outline does not really match it. He's just sketched on top of a pre-existing drawing and made it look more appealing. This drawing is really well done, I'm assuming directly corrected by the chief animation director of the episode. And I love how confused Nobara looks here. This whole run cycle here is really well animated. Simple actions like running, hand-to-hand -hand combat or walking, if these were to look good, they would require a very high level of character acting strength from the animator's side, which is why episode 13 of Jujutsu Kaisen struggled quite a bit towards that end portion. While Unga Bunga fight scenes are just more popular, fights that have more emphasis on choreography will just be more impressive to me, simply because it's more impressive on a technical level of just character animation. The same thing is happening here. It's just a regular old run cycle with Nobara and Mahito that goes on for a pretty decent amount of time. But every single one of these movements, they're so lifelike and it must have taken so much effort for the animator to do this. This whole run cycle is animated by Keisuke Namioka, who's a very new animator in the industry. He's worked on the Ruby anime, Zom 100 and Jujutsu Kaisen Season 2. So back to back to back shows with extremely bad production conditions. As always, the perspectives are also really interesting. That's the tendon of Nobara's foot and that's so well drawn. Just look at that vault over, for example. How many frames are over there? and how natural the character acting looks. This portion here again looks like it's back to Kosuke Kato, but it's actually animated by Shotaro Tamemizu, which means Shotaro Tamemizu is a very good grasp of timing focused animation as well. This really does look like a continuation of Kato's sequence. Again, the camera movement here is very deliberate. It's like showing Yuji's POV, just darting his focus between all these different portions of Maito. Again, really nice animation here. All these bouncy Mahitos are so well drawn and the ease in into this motion over here also really well done. Yeah, the speed up at the very end there because he's coming closer to the camera. Masterful stuff. Another really good vault over and the way he goes down the steps here as well. Just so well done. I'm wondering if they use someone as reference for that. Excellent Yuji drawing. The way his pupil is drawn here just shows the shock and surprise. He's looking at Nobara who does nothing for some reason. She could have definitely moved out of the way. She had many seconds to do so. Talking about the animation here, the layouts are entirely done by Naoki Mejima. Of course, the layout would be the most important step for a shot such as this one because it's a complex rotation shot that connects one, two, three, and four characters. That's just extremely skilled layout work by Mejima making something like this possible. There is melting, but it's nothing offensive or anything. It's just the very little expected amount of melting that comes with a complex sequence such as this one. Could it be polished further? Yes. But again, in these production conditions, I expect it to be much worse. I expect it to be like at least Chainsaw Man level melting, which we don't see here, which is incredible. Great smear with the way Yuji is coming in here and the punch has a lot of motion blur. That's again something that we did not see in Kozuke Kato sequence because this animation timing is so amazing that you don't need motion blur on top of that. We go to a flashback, now Chibi designs again. You see a very normal looking shot over here, but he's not satisfied with that. You get this fantastic perspective on all three of these characters. You would never expect a face like this to look so three-dimensional. This is the face that's been designed to be looked from the front side. Looking at it from any other side, it would kind of break the charm if the animator cannot keep up with the idea of drawing a face like this in a complex perspective. But whoever did the illustration here, yeah, they definitely aced it. So while yeah, all these three drawings have incredible perspectives, the one on the far left with the chibi face, definitely the most impressive one. 
I wonder who animated this. Could it be no credit Koki Fujimoto? There's no way. But this FX animation over here looks very Fujimoto-esque for some reason. But yeah, they are playing Smash Bros. And uh, in season one, I remember Nobara saying something like she's good at Smash Bros. Nothing much to talk about this portion in terms of animation. It's just a strong show of incredible art direction combined with just consistently good drawings that keep up with the complex perspectives such as this one. No simple layouts whatsoever when Naoki Mijima is the director. Then you also get sequences where it is truly really well animated as well like this one. It is comical character acting. The designs are very simple but even with all of that considered this first cut is still really really good. I love the foreshortening here with Nobara's design. That is so well done. And yeah the next drawing as well. Again look at this knee over here for example. I like how she's drawn like a, an absolute gremlin and to contrast all of the chibi designs you have this drawing which is extremely well detailed and while this old person does not really have any bad intentions with like providing food this person's intentions are not the idea it's about conveying the creepy vibe with a stranger just giving you food for no reason and that creepiness is conveyed by the juxtaposition of art styles from here to here. This is not only simple from a drawing point of view, but also from the art direction, like look at the background. But here, you're making it look as realistic as possible within the constraints of Jujutsu Kaisen's art style. And that works so well. That's multi-layer shading for the inside of the person's palms. Blob face, once again, I don't think I'll ever get tired of this face. It's really cute. And even when she's older, the blob face just works so well. God, that is so good. No nose, no mouth, no lips, not even using the eyebrows. To convey the emotions so usually you convey the emotions in animation designs with the eyebrows mostly everything that's happening here is happening through the eyes and of course the blushes that are placed in the area where the nose would exist animated inside her eyes of course showing that it's a reflective surface in this case especially reflective because she's getting teary eyed i love small things like that that make so much difference look at this drawing supremely well drawn like that is as faithful to the koiso designs as they can be and it continues like with these designs as well there's they're so well drawn man we do see uh nobara's eye popping out yeah that's her eye really nice perspective animation on nobara here as well she goes down on her knees the body language is so well animated the character acting is just very lifelike it's actually the exact opposite because she's fucking dying but you get the idea. It's very natural, it's what I'm trying to say. Like she completely loses control of her body because she's fucking dead. She goes down on her knees. When she goes down on her knees, because of the momentum, her arms and hair, they're swinging backwards. She gets on her knees. Now she hunches forwards before her hips get lowered. So she just falls backwards. These two tiny lines around Yuji's pupils, look at how much they add. In stuff like that, that's where the appeal of animation lies. Another exceptional storyboard work over here, just having everything sink in literally for yuji and making him feel as small and alone as possible that's the end of episode 19 let's get right into episode 20 which is my second favorite episode in the entire fucking franchise for those wondering what my favorite jujutsu kaisen episodes are number one season two episode five number two this and number three episode 16 in terms of animation though i would say episode 16 the best season two episode five second a very close second and then episode 13 of season one starting with a blood droplet beautiful blood droplet that could be auto in between really cool storyboard idea trends Transitioning from spillage into spillage. Yeah, this is clearly supervised by Tadashi Hiramatsu. I love how Megumi is not even helping here. He's just panting like an area where there's no spillage. Once again, this drawing on Nobara here is just so quirky. Not really following the designs. Once again, Yuji Tokuno using the lighting here. This is pretty much overblown with warm colors and light bubbles, bloom. And then we cut to like extremely cold colors and no bloom whatsoever. And this especially, it looks like you're in a mortuary with the shot it's it's very weird how they are pulling that off with just the lighting because planning out stuff like that is not expected in the studio about this drawing right here i mean i don't need to talk about all the strong drawings in this episode this video would be too long if i did that but this one specifically in the layout done by durian kulon it already looks really good but of course the corrections took that to the next level the layout here is just straight up evil i did not ask for pov nobara's eye socket thanks yuji tokuno starting from here exceptional drawing here the line work is excellent again the animation is entirely by durian kulon fully mapped out the movement and all of that movement translated to the final product really well there's so much good layout that keeps getting wasted that did not happen here because first of all Dorian Kulan being so amazing at providing really well polished layouts I've seen him post on Twitter time and time again he's an advocate of having highly polished layout while that might result in sacrificing your ambition for the scene it's much better than having an ambitious shot that completely gets ruined in the final product Dorian does not let that happen he makes sure his layout is usable by keeping it as polished as possible of course if he had more time he would also just do the second key animation or well the genga for his own scenes hello this is edit 
Major Malcoman. I'm just gonna jump scare you with a small negative knowledge. So Dorian did actually do the Gengar for the scene. Now while it was heavily corrected by Yuki Kikuchi, Dorian still applied those corrections himself. So this is excellent work by Dorian. This is like the best possible end result and I'm spending so much time on this because this is some of the best character acting in the entire show. The line work keeps getting more and more uneven. Like look at the way his hair is drawn here. There are no secondary shadows, right? It's Kaganashi. It's like every single stroke of his hair is followed by an incomplete inky line on top of that. And those additional incomplete ink strokes, they look like they're moving independently from all that line work. Yuji is completely broken inside out and that's shown through the animation. The cut of Mahito's feet here done by Zisho Shao. I don't know if I butchered his name. He worked under a pen name if I'm not mistaken. You get that camera shake with him running across the screen to show just how fast he's running. This is the final Yuji cut and yeah, the incomplete inky strokes are much more visible over here and you can really tell that Yuji is just completely broken. Starting here is the final sequence that Benjamin Ford did for Jujutsu Kaisen Season 2. His layout for this is very well completed. Strong anticipation on this punch. It's double anticipation. You hold this pose to then pull through the actual punch pose and the frames to pull to that pose is just a smeared eyeball and then the palm comes in front. Extremely strong drawings. Once again, the light is so incredibly well done. Um, just look at that. That is just normal lighting and then the focus is entirely on Mahito here. Really nice impact frames over here. I wish I could see them. These once again look like straight up Koki Fujimoto impact frames. Once again look at this build up and release. A double release over here. First all this effects get blown from Yuji's back and then it actually hits Yuji and he's just just pinballs. While Dorian's scene does end there, the amazing sense of timing from Tokuno's side does not. Once again carrying all that momentum to the next cut which is a still frame but you can still tell that Yuji was thrown so hard because that entire scene of Yuji going from here to here is pretty much skipped. That's how fast he's being thrown. He's in slow motion but then Mahito's palm just comes in regular motion, grabs his collar and then throws him around. Kick to the head, go to slow motion again, just I mean if you bleed that much you're supposed to be dead. There are so many good drawings in this episode that people thought this was Tadashi Hiramatsu. This is not Tadashi Hiramatsu, it's just one of the dozens of extremely skilled animation directors that were part of this episode. Yuji Tokuno Storyboats, it's like Shota Kuchizono but a little bit more momentum oriented. I don't even know how to explain that, but it feels very much aligned with Gosso Vision. Again, just look at how fantastic this layout is. You've already heard the Thodo clap. Yuji is nowhere to be seen. If this was just a close-up of Mahito, we wouldn't know if Yuji just dodged the attack, but Yuji's just, it's just gone. Combined with the clap that you just heard, you know what's happening. And it's my brother's entrance. Uh, once again, animated by Dorian Kulon, he did an exceptional job here once again. Now, for these cuts, I do not necessarily know if it's Kakani or not. I would think so. But then again, it's Dorian Kulon. This cut, which I would say is like a signature cut for Jujutsu Kaisen. In the layout for this, you can see that it has a lot of individual frames and it's really well animated. But for the layout for this cut, there aren't as many frames. I of course don't think that he used Kakani in the layout phase of that first scene because Kakani is usually done in the in-betweening process. Whatever it may be, this is just the best use of auto in-betweening. It's not ruining Dorian's animation whatsoever. It is a tool that assists. It is something that cannot and should not be used for every single scene. But for a scene like this one where the animator himself can control the auto in betweening, it can turn out as something really beautiful. Of course, the change in lighting, not exactly subtle when Thoda walks in. It's not really the lighting. It is how the colors are used. It's the saturation because this is a very bright shot in the sense that it's got a lot of light. That's like 20% of the screen that's entirely white because of the light source, but it's also very desaturated. As soon as Thoda walks in, those same lights, they now look like they're coming down from the heavens. Toto literally walks in with the color. This entire cut, again, it was very well polished in Dorian's version, but it was pretty much entirely reanimated for the final product. The manga accuracy most likely just comes from Yuji Tokuno's request. Just looking at his directorial corrections, it does look like he wants at least a few of the shots to be manga accurate. But the thing is, not even the correction posted by MAPPA on their Twitter lines up with the final product. The final product is even more manga accurate than the correction that was posted by MAPPA. Just a blind guess, I would assume this is Sote Yamazaki because Sote Yamazaki is the manga accuracy correction guy for Jujutsu Kaisen. He fills in a lot of roles, but manga accuracy guy is definitely one of those roles. So maybe the correction was recorrected by Sote Yamazaki or he just last minute redrew the scene. Again, just look at these layouts. That is so incredibly complex and I wouldn't be surprised if Goso popped up and did something like this. I guess Yuji Takuno just likes really complex storyboards as well. That is an extremely well exaggerated, awesome looking fisheye perspective. It's not as warped as Goso's fisheye effects go, but the idea of spacing is just as excellent as you see in Goso's storyboards. Just look at this random fucking drawing. Just look at how good that looks. Just look at how heavily stylized this looks. Todo has never looked like this 
and there is not a single shot in this episode or any of the episodes where Thodor looks like that. It's just for this one scene that he looks like a fucking One Punch Man character. He looks like Saitama in a serious mode over here. Uh, like a sketch pen, thick, matte, black color that's been applied on top of his eyes. That also carries to the shading on his bro, his cheeks and the neck muscles. And when Yuji opens his eyes, he's straining so much because he's hurt so much. But the way Tokuno has laid out the shot, it's made to look like Todo is shining so bright that Yuji can't even look directly at him. He's so disappointed in his own pathetic state that he can't face the person who has unconditional love for him. Some more exceptional character acting here. Gosh, that's so good. Another random, incredibly well-drawn Toto shot. Maito comes in with pretty much perfect lip sync. Great layout for the shot once again. Uh, whoever did the correction for you, I would love to know who's the CAD here. Look at those drawings. Three different layers of shading everywhere. His face, his hair, his clothes. Look at the detail on Mahito's arm here. The spiky arm, so incredibly well detailed. Again, transfers to the next scene as well. And then they go to the highlight drawing. Look at that Toto face. Once again, Toto is not an easy character to draw. The hardest is probably Hanami. And after that, Toto. But he looks so good in that two second clip. He could have totally looked mediocre and it would have been fine. I also much prefer the way uh, they are showing Toto's technique here. No need of constant impact frames, which is how we were shown in episode 20. I like, I like impact frames. Anyone who's followed me for a good amount of time would know that I am one of the biggest appreciators of impact frames that there is. But sometimes they're not required. Maybe in this specific case, that is Toto's technique, I prefer not having impact frames because that's how I was first exposed to it. Kenichi Kutsuna's interpretation of Toto's technique from the Shingoyama opening. And that's what Tokuno is doing here as well. It is shown that the switch is happening because of the cursed energy, right? It is a cursed technique and thus will have cursed energy. So both of these energies that you see, they are Toto's energy, I'm assuming. So it is made very much clear that switching is happening over there and that a cursed technique is being used without having to resort to constant impact frames, which in season two especially would suck even more because of the TV regulations. And every time something switches, it would have to be dimmed. And now it's Maito's turn to get pinballed. Here once again, just the most unique way of showing the switch. You see speed lines over there. That is the Toto panel coming in with the clap, using him to hide what's happening in the background. I mean, that's just the medium of animation being used to its max potential. I guess this is what Chainsaw Man fans wanted from Aki vs. Katana Man. In the manga, you can see the Cursed Devil's finger coming into the panel by breaking the borders, which is an idea that wasn't really explored in the anime because the anime focused on realism. I'm not saying that would have been better than what we got in the anime. Koki Fujimoto's Aki vs. Katana Man is still one of my favorite sequences in animation as a whole. But Jujutsu Kaisen, under Shota Koshizono's vision, fully embraces the creativity. How else would you do this? You could cut to Toto, show him clap, and then cut back. Or you could split screen it, show Toto clap and then go back to full screen. But physically cutting the shot for Toto to appear and show the clap is just so much more appealing and so much more unique. Once again, incredible illustration of Mahito here. I got a frame by frame that. Gosh, that looks so good. The eye twitch over here and just his resting face over here as well. Man, another shot that was confused for a Tadashi Hiramatsu shot because of just how appealing it looks. But no, again, it's just one of the other dozens upon dozens of incredible animation directors who worked on this episode. I wish I knew exactly who did this. If I had to take a random guess, I think it's Mitsue Mori. I could be very much wrong. Gosh, look at that back. Again, really good perspective and just so detailed. And Nanami's weapon as well. Not as impressive as Nobara's weapon in terms of the perspective, but still very well detailed. I thought I would see Nanami fight with it unwrapped at some point, because I think it being wrapped is another pact, right? So that it could be stronger while it's unwrapped. A little bit of missed potential with Nanami, I would say. Like we also only saw his collapse technique. I don't know what it's called. Whatever thing that Keichiro Watanabe animated in season one. We only saw Nanami do that once. I guess him not getting the opportunity to do that technique is also very much in line with what Jujutsu Kaisen stands for. Death just fucking happens. Death won't wait for you to show off your final techniques. Exceptional perspectives and lighting work once again, Todo under the spotlight. That's how Yuji sees him. When you cut back to the beginning of the cut and then you go frame by frame, you do see it lighting up Yuji. This is another shot from the opening. Now I understand what it's about. It's Yuji trying to deal with the consequences of all the people that he has killed. And yeah, once again, not really subtle use of lighting, but it works. Oh, look at that. Another change in location and I have a mustache again. Yes, I've moved back to my hometown. Long time viewers probably have seen me record here before. Maybe I think Chainsaw Man episode one. But it's been a very hectic month. I'm gonna start a completely different phase of my life. I don't know if I'll be able to keep uploading videos like at all. But 
I do have time right now. So having time right now, the least I can do is at least finish this one video. I don't have the best lighting setup here. I only have a tube light up there and just some natural sunlight. But hey, my videos are about the animation. So I'll just get right into it. Pick up exactly where I left off. And well, looks like I stopped at a pretty good place. This is the Shota Kuchizono sequence. What I consider to be his best sequence in terms of raw animation. Shota Kuchizono takes the experimental factor to the next level because he is never animated in a Shinya Ohira style. And I don't think we've ever seen a Shinya Ohira style of morphing kind of animation in Jujutsu Kaisen ever. We've never got into this level of experimental animation in the entirety of Jujutsu Kaisen and it's coming from the series director and as the episode directors, animators, layout artists etc are working on your show, this is the example that Goso is putting forth. This is what he wants from every single one of them. Jujutsu Kaisen season 2 is simply the embodiment of full freedom of expression from young talent in the anime industry. So breaking down the animation itself, it is clearly extremely Shinya Ohira inspired. It looks very Goso-esque from the storyboards. I'm assuming he did the storyboards himself over here because you start with fisheye, you end with fisheye. There's a lot of fisheye effects and a lot of playing with perspectives such as this shot right here. Look at that. That's Mahito's hand that is so far in front that it's covering the rest of his body. I don't think you could get any lens and shoot it from any direction where showing a person's hand would cover the entirety of the rest of their body unless you well, warp the camera which is exactly what Goso is doing here to exaggerate the perspectives. Goso's usual animation style is very methodical. Everything is planned out from the layout phase which is usually CGI assisted. He maps out the backgrounds, the character movement. He's so proficient with both the mediums of 2D and 3D animation that in the final product it rarely looks like it started off with a 3D base. The impressive thing about something like this of course is that usually you need whole studios to pull up stuff like this but it's becoming more and more common that just one artist does everything. This idea though of a single person like doing every single component of the animation, it's a topic fascinating enough that it could deserve its own video. Maybe like a Mitsuo Iso focus and the ripple effect that he's caused in the industry. But well, the point is, Shoto Koshizono was one of those people who used heavy self-made 2D 3D mixing. So for him to use this style, which is entirely raw 2D animation is absolutely something that was completely unexpected. There is an argument to be made that he's making it easier for the other pipelines by animating everything himself because this obviously I don't see how this could have animation director input. Everything is so off model and that's the appeal of this animation that I don't think that an animation director could actually correct anything. Of course it would further complicate things for the in-betweeners but I doubt that this even needed in-betweening because it is quite a bit choppy. It's not as fluid as let's say Akira Hota sequences who animates in a very similar style. So there is a pretty good chance that Shoto Kuchizono just animated every single drawing here all by himself. Fully off model, everything fully smeary at all times. Some of the drawings are really cool as well like this drawing with Mahito's face is really well done. I love the three dimensionality on his face and look at the shot. Look at how beautifully laid out it is. Completely breaking model to the absolute extreme degrees. Like what even am I looking at right now? Mahito is in like sections. The most simple kind of impact frame ever. It reminds me of some of Yen Yen's uh, line art that he uses. Very pencil-esque line art. But that is of course an impact frame. I think that counts as one. But here he's using pencil lines with crayon-esque lines as well to act as mirrors. Some more incredibly exaggerated perspectives. Similar type of impact frame once again. This is it. This is an amazing cut. First of all, look at the perspective once again. To take an incredibly complex perspective like this and moving that through space in such a natural way, like Maito's shoulder is only appearing over here, right? And we see his right eye there as well. We start with his left eye. We switch to his right eye. You can see just the sheer level of volume that his eye has. You can see the proper curvature of his eye and the glint in the blade as well. The blue exaggerated glint turning into smears and then closing in on the camera. Man, that is so well done. The most difficult thing about this style is knowing what the motion in the final product will look like because every single frame has literally no consistency whatsoever. It's like the demerits that exist in melting an animation is used as a strength for this specific type of animation. But the difficult part is just that knowing if I make a drawing like this, does this make sense? as a still frame drawing. It doesn't. Mahito's forearm pretty much has one, two, three, four, five, six sections and his digits, they make no sense. To know what the previous drawings and what the next subsequent drawings need to look like such that the scene makes sense in actual motion. That knowledge is what comes from the sheer amount of experience that you've gained from just drawing for hundreds of thousands of hours and for a relatively inexperienced artist with the burden of being a director and still experimenting in a completely unique style that he's never tried before to pull it off to this level of perfection is unheard of and that's why Shoto Koshizuno really is the biggest genius of our generation. So what he's doing here is he's rotating the wrist backwards if you see that. The wrist is pretty much rotated backwards so he's giving like a whip-like motion. 
This single cut is by a different artist. I'm not gonna bother trying to pronounce their name. But the style is so incredibly similar that I feel like Gosso might have just corrected this because you see the same crayon smears here. It's not like Gosso could direct that animator to just animate in the specific way for this one cut because animation is not that easy. You stick to your style. That's what you usually do unless you're Shoto Gizono. And I haven't really seen this animator animate in this specific style before. They have more of a standard animation style. Though in this very episode, they do animate in this style for one cut. I'm just very confused. This is such a weird, weird production. <laughs> Again, just animating his uh, arm in like a very whip-like manner. And Toto just teleports in between all of that. No fancy light effects or anything. It looks awkward when viewed in animation. This only looks right if you also hear the audio with it. Audio of the clap, that is. And I'm glad the sound effects do keep up with the rest of the elements of the episode because, yeah, that comes after animation, right? Sound direction and music placement comes like in the last day of this production. And to have all of that keep up with the animation is, is extraordinary. I love the little smirk that Toto has here. The punch being thrown here. What a cool impact frame. This has Toto's entire silhouette over here and pencil scribbles everywhere else. And I also think it's very cool how the background is not changing colors whatsoever. You usually need different colors in background for impact frames, but this is the same background layer used for the impact frames as well. Never seen anything like that. I don't know if it's intentional or not, but it looks cool. So I'm fine with it. And there ends the Gosso scene, an incredible Gosso sequence. Might be my favorite Gosso sequence ever. I do really, really love Gosso's traditional animation as well. He's pretty much perfected that style of animation, but then he goes ahead and tries something completely different. And that's why Gosso is one of my favorite artists of all time. Another extremely cool layout. If I didn't know that Yuji Tokuno directed this, this would be a very easy guess to say that it's Shota Kushizono. Easy but wrong because it's not Gusso. It's a fisheye shot with an incredible level of depth perception. I love these drawings over here. The corrections here are so quirky. It is still really well drawn, but I mean, it's off model in the sense that they're not following the character sheets whatsoever. The person who was AD for this segment is once again Yuki Kikuchi. At least the base AD, his corrections did get recorrected. I'm pretty sure in the final version. Another extraordinary piece of storyboarding. The hands combining. <laughs> Funnily enough, the ghosting actually works here uh, to transition between the fists. This is another callback to Foki Fujimoto's Black Flash. Back then it was Yuji's saliva that was dripping and this time it's his tear droplet. Incredibly well drawn Nanami here again. Wow. I don't think Nanami has looked this good outside of Yamaso's corrections. We transition into Dr. Bean once again. Dr. Bean was one of our most surprising artists. His work from episode 14 was a standout as one of the most fluid cuts from that episode. It does seem like he enjoys using impact frames quite a bit. Unfortunately, they got fucked in the ass because of the ghosting and dimming. Absolutely atrocious. Thankfully, look at what we have here, his uh, production materials. So all of his impact frames went completely uncorrected. If you are asking whether impact frames are corrected, yes, there are cases where impact frames are corrected. You also do see that later on in this very episode. So yeah, starting off with a very cool looking inky cross flare. Uh, most of this does look inky, but here it almost looks like charcoal-esque. And here it more looks like a very classic uh, Yutaka Nakamura impact frame. He's using many different styles of impact frames. There's a little bit of Koki Fujimoto in there, but these charcoal-like textures, it's what I like the most, I think. This is another very classic Yutaka Nakamura technique, show an impact frame and then reverse that, show the negative of that. These drawings are so powerful on their own and they are just part of impact frames, they're singular drawings. Yeah, these are just some absolutely gorgeous impact frames. I do think here the colors are supposed to come in, so it's transitioning to some Genga-esque work here. Yeah, that is definitely Genga, right? Cool effects animation here again. It's not really Kutsuna Lightning because it does not flow as consistently as Kutsuna Lightning, but it does look more like Lightning. It's very frantic. This is another Yuki Kikuchi correction or well initial drawing because it was recorrected before it reached the final version. And it's another very manga accurate drawing showing that yeah, Yuji Tokuno really loves that manga accurate style. Really cool smoke effects here. A bubble forms up. That's the shockwave of the punch. And the dissipation of that bubble looks so nice. Almost like Nozomu Abe-esque. The timing is so good with that as well. Amazing smears on the Mahito tumbling backwards as well. It's really a perfect piece of animation. And the way it's seamlessly transitioning to him doing like a windmill to regain his balance and then get back on his feet is so cool. So well done. Look how animated his work is, man. Yeah, that character animation is so spot on. There's something happening at all times. Stuff like this is very difficult to do because it requires more number of drawings and more number of drawings, obviously more difficult than less number of drawings. But that exaggerated body language that he's giving Mahito on top of having small other stuff like, you know, the spoke animation and his hand morphing to get healed. That's some beautiful morphing animation as well. The soda animation is just a work of art. I love it. Not necessarily anatomically correct, but it doesn't need to be. I love how quirky it looks. And just look at Yuji's getting ready stance. That could have been as easy as doing this. It could have been just that. But instead of just this motion, look at that. It's 
this motion. His entire body is moving. Obviously, that's literally better from an animation standpoint, but the reason you don't see that usually is because, yeah, that takes more effort. You're moving every single element of a character. Now, when I was watching this episode for the first time, I was like, what the fuck are you doing? Get back to Yuji and Toto. I want to get back to the hype. Because this scene, I know what it's going to be like. It's just a tearjerker scene that's breaking up the action, padding it so that these characters, when put amidst the action later into the episodes, won't look out of place. Because, yeah, you're showing that they are present over here. That's the purpose of the scene. I did not care much about that. I wanted to go back to the fight. But once I finished watching this whole segment, it's undoubtedly the most technical impressive work of art in the whole show. It feels like a segment of an Eve music video thrown in between a Jujutsu Kaisen episode. That kind of makes sense because yes, uh, Lighton, the artist who pretty much did this whole scene, has also directed an Eve MV. Talking about Eve MV, there's also a little bit of that in the next episode as well. So that's kind of cool. So while most people would think of this as a still frame, it is not a still frame. You can see that the shadows are coming in, the lighting is coming in and moving appropriately. All of that has to be animated by an animator. It's one of the more underrated components of animation I say. Again, this still frame, it works as a wallpaper. Every single component here works incredibly well. I love the art direction, especially what Lighton has decided to do with the outside portion of the train. It does not necessarily look realistic, but that brings a specific vibe to the shot. The way the light from the outside is also bouncing on top of her, whether that's digital light, as you can see here, or just animated shading, as you can see with her hair. Taken one level up in the next shot right over here, that's godlike. And there's also a little bit of dynamic lighting with this train coming in over here. The whole inside side portion of this train is eliminated and that changes as well. That slow transition of lighting. Also look at her hair over here. The light is bouncing off from here, like half portion of her head that slowly goes away as the light source, that is the opposite train goes away. There's no dialogue in this one particular cut. There's the sound effects of the train and letting the visuals do its thing. This cut is a change of pace that we needed to now get invested in what's happening over here. The corrections are so good over here. It's by Shun. Shun's corrections from episode 14 were also so great. They were incredibly well detailed, but it still had more volume than you would expect from even this level of detail. I especially love this Maki close-up, such a strong drawing. Her outlines are very well defined. The portion of her hair where the light is directly hitting, there's no outlines there whatsoever. Whereas the one in the shadows, they have very well defined black outlines. That also works with her face. Her face is outlined by really well defined black outlines, but on the portion where the light is directly hitting, it's more like a dark skin colored outline. It's actually the same color as the rest of her skin, but that is being used as an outline. Love this bit of animation here again. Uh, the light that's moving on top of Mecham. Oh wow. When you think about it, it's just one color added on top of another color, which gives us the illusion of a reflective surface, right? This is not an actual shiny surface. It's just two different colors. And just the way those two different colors are interacting gives it that shiny effect. When you break it down to the simple level, animation does not make sense. But when you get lost in it, when you get immersed in it, you don't even notice that it does not make sense. And that's what's so special about animation. Like this 2D cutout of a completely unrealistic looking woman, we perceive her as a real person. Character animation uh, excellence here once again, like look at these lines over here. Those get thicker. Feels like she's welling up trying to hold her tears. Yeah, so while these might look like still frames, as I said before, none of these are still frames. It is continuously animated. And these cuts, the best piece of character acting I've ever seen in Jujutsu Kaisen. Some of the best bits of character acting I've ever seen, period. So notice here, that's a perfect circle. But over here, it looks like there's a cut over here, right? It's, it's more like the shape of a fruit than a perfect circle. A fruit that's not an orange because an orange is a circle. Over here, it's like a perfect curve. But over here, it just bends inward a little bit and then bends out. So giving that shape to the pupil. That's generally done when a character is sad to show that they're about to cry. That's because their eyeball is pretty much filled with tears. So the light that bouncing off of their eye, it is refracted a little bit because of the water content. So the pupil, it's not a perfect circle anymore. It's a little bit bent inwards. Everything moves, including her hair. Look at how naturally her hair just flows on top of her shoulders over here. Um, I'm getting, I just got goosebumps. Hair movement to the way her mouth, to the way her facial features animated. Also well done. Look at the shading on her eyelashes. Again, masterful. I love the surprised expression on Miva's face over here. Uh, man, it, this reminds me of like high school days when I just used to sketch anime eyes continuously. Anyone who's interested in anime art and wanted to get into art, you know what I'm talking about. You just continuously keep sketching different types of eyes. And this just feels like a very classic anime eye. The most difficult components of drawing Drawing eyes are usually something that you wouldn't expect, at least as a viewer, like getting the right thickness for the eyelashes, especially in this area, 
it's very difficult to not make it look awkward. To do that, especially in motion, must be much more difficult. Shun's quirky art coming in here once again, but God, this is the single best cut of animation in this episode. Very similar to like the Dorian Kolam cut from the beginning of the episode where Yuji breaks down and the art kind of gets more dirty. Almost all lines here are properly defined, like her nose bridge and her eyes for the most part as well, properly defined. Next frame, look at her nose bridge jagged, sharp, uneven lines. Her pupils also completely change shape from perfect circles to like, well, not perfect circles. It's again, very jagged. Her under lashes, once again, it's not really perfect over here either, but it gets worse in the next drawing and with extra lines underneath the eyes as well to show strain. And it feels like it just progressively breaks apart until the tears just fully flow out. At that point, she's accepted what's happened. When her palms come in, yeah, her hair interacts with the palms appropriately, that hair being folded inwards properly, Ah, that's, that's too good. That is too good. The exceptional drawing work does not end here. It continues. Uh, this is a Shun collection, but it also does look like a Yamaso collection. I'm assuming Yamaso CAD for this portion, maybe. The shading over here looks very Yamaso-esque. This, once again, it might be a, a Yamaso collection as chief animation director. It looks more like something Takuya Denumo would draw, but which, of course, is one of the styles that Yamaso has in his repertoire. Love the way the heavy steps are shown over here. Rubble just bursting up when Mahito is just running. And this is one of the cuts by Mephisto. So Mephisto is one of the same of this episode in terms of the animation. Really cool to see him back. I guess he's friends with Dorian Kolon because the last time Dorian Kolon worked as like a almost like a production assistant in the Hayato Kurosaki episode bringing in all of his friends to save the project. Mephisto was one of the animators over there and now with this episode once again Dorian Kolon is heavily involved in this one and Mephisto is here once again but uh, Mephisto's work over here much more polished than his work in the previous episode. Uh, this cut is great but his few cuts towards the end of the episode might be his like his career best work. This one cut over here is Toshiyuki Sato. I would have never guessed it because Sato has so many different styles. The hammer swings, they look very heavy. Boom, boom. Gosh, that's so good. Look at how slow Toto is moving over here. And once he gets hit by the hammer, boom, he's off the screen extremely quickly. When Yuji comes down, it's actually Toto blocking because they switch positions and then switch position once again with Yuji coming in. Another uh, Mephisto cut, I think, over there. Again, this is not really fully finished animation. It could absolutely be better, uh, except this one cut. This one cut looks awesome. These are the regular character proportions, but they compress them, absolutely compress them as much as possible. Because what did I tell you? The release is more satisfying when you get a build up in the opposite direction. So what is the release over here? The release is that these two characters are about to separate. To make the pushness more pronounced, you pull inside first. So the animator is grabbing these two characters and crushing them together. And once they are crushed in as much as possible, look at Toto's arm over here. That's not possible to be have the arm that far back inwards. And look at Yuji over here. You cannot crush him any further. And just as I say that, look at the next frame. <laughs> then a smear and then boom, complete change in Toto's pose. As cramped up as possible over here, and as free as possible over here. Look at how much he's stretching over here. Everything that can be straightened out is straightened out. His leg is stretching as much as possible, but that's not all. It's not just like this. It's more like this. His, as you can see, his left shoulder here is pointing downwards. It's not level with his right shoulder. His right shoulder is stretching forwards as much as possible to throw Yuji forwards as fast as possible. Of course, his right arm is just a smear and Yuji is invisible, followed up by sonic boom rings and just a spark of electricity as well, because electricity is something that is associated with speed. And Yuji's, again, just a ball. Just look at that, the simplistic design. That is his hair, because we know Yuji's hair color and that's the rest of his body. That's an oval shape with another oval inside of that. And we know that is Yuji. And from here, that smears up and opens up. Not many frames there whatsoever to define that opening up of the sphere turning into Yuji, but it still works in motion because it's going so fast. And I love the layout that Tokuno has used over here. Not only does it give us a very good sense of space, because if you look at the very back, this crater over here, that's where Yuji was getting his shit kicked in. And now we get Mahito over here. Look at how far back he's placed. Why is he placed so far back? So that you can show the destruction properly of how strong Yuji's coming down. Uh, everything turns from art direction, which is here. It is part of the background painting to hand animation. This entire rubble over here is drawn by an animator. Love the way the effects look here as well. Almost looks like Shingo Yama-esque effects. Actually, no, that's Hayato Kurosaki effects for sure. A beautiful looking cube wave as well. That is so satisfying. I love these shots as well. This looks so much like the callback to the Tanaka episode from the previous season. Mahito from down looking at Yuji cracking through a hole on top. Now we get some Toshiyuki Sato craziness. Standard trigger drawings with Mahito over here. He is so 
animated like look at that when you view it frame by frame you see just how crazy he's made Mahito look and then Mahito just blows himself up kind of similar to the scene that Toshi Kisato himself animated in episode 13 again the Tanaka episode just look at that scene and now look at this scene does not look like it was done by the same animator whatsoever but again Toshi Kisato is a champion of completely different styles there's a really cool Mahito drawing somewhere over here yeah <laughs> yeah that's 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 the best Mahito's ever looked right there. When the effects pop up, it's very easy to tell who did this. The level of detail put in there because of the sheer quantity of shading, absurd. And yeah, it's Hayato Kurosaki. Next cut, I tweeted about this. Oh, wow. That is the most satisfying looking smoke ever, man. Just the way it flows. Real life smoke does not look this good. It looks less like smoke and more like whipped cream. And that dissipates beautifully. Look at all these layers of smoke. Oh gosh. Like, how do you even get to this level? Do you just dedicate your entire life to the art of animating smoke? I guess people are just passionate about weird shit. There's Kazunori Ozawa who is extremely passionate about animating explosions. And we also have Hayato Kurosaki who is extremely passionate about just animating smoke. A very cool layout here. Again, something that can be used as a wallpaper. It's so cool. Warping across, of course. Once again, if I didn't know Yuji Tokuno was the director of this episode, I would guess it was Goso. Another incredibly manga accurate art, but also not really being manga accurate. It's like emulating the soul of the manga's art. Jujutsu Kaisen manga's art is very rough, it's very expressive because of the roughness. And this, while having the base layout look like the manga's art, is also completely modified with the beautiful effects animation and the way the character is drawn in its own. Uh, Nobara is mostly just defined by crayon esque shading, and that captures the soul of the manga's art without looking like a one-to-one -one copy. And I love when Jujutsu Kaisen also does goofy shit like this, just a fucking train curse. Well, we get to that background now. The art direction did fail there quite a bit, but hey, what can you do? That was probably done in like minutes. His technique is just so crazy. It's ridiculous how he can just do this with one touch. And yeah, you can really tell that it hurts quite a bit as well. Like right before they are transfigured, they have this horrifying expression and even tear up and cry before they are just fucking turned into swords. It's not necessarily incredibly impressive animation or anything. It's just very dynamic storyboarding that makes the animation look more impressive than it actually is. That's all the animation is doing here. It's just keeping up with the storyboards, not doing anything exceptionally fancy like we saw with the previous scenes in this episode. Of course, keeping up with dynamic storyboards is impressive in its own regard, but yeah, that's a pretty cool cut though. Yeah, I love the correction on Toido over here. So his hand does come over here. I don't know how he claps. He's grabbing both of the swords. Maybe Toto is so dummy thick that he can clap with his ass cheeks. He switches his position with the right blade and then kicks him in the face. In terms of animation, it's not as perfect as this could be, but because of the way it's storyboarded with rapid cuts, it works. Again, not saying that it's bad animation whatsoever. It's still really, really good animation. This might be an animation error over here. The way he smiles, opens his mouth, looks kind of weird. But hey, what can you do? Again, constantly moving, constantly changing locations, constantly being dynamic, showing a piece of rubble at the very edge of the screen. Toto comes, grabs it. Just a maximum viewer connection over here. When someone is picking up something right in front of our faces, we might even forget that we are not actually there. Coming in right now are proper Soyama corrections. All of this animated by Kohei Hirota, a very young animator, worked mostly on My Hero Academia. Clearly a big fan of Yutaka Nakamura from the kind of impact frames he uses. I love the background animation over here. Look at this first layer that is going past the screen very quickly. Quickly. That first layer reminds me of this Utapon cut. All of these, while animated by Kohei Hirota, is just very rough yellow work. Everything else is corrected by Sota Yamazaki, including the impact frames. He did redraw the impact frames to fit the character modification that he's made to Yuji. Unfortunately, the impact frames are heavily ghosted and dimmed, as usual. The anticipation is incredibly strong here, building up for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. That's like 25 frames. And then the release is just Boom! Again, very utopian smears. It honestly kind of looks like Dr. Bean's effects animation as well, but it's not Dr. Bean. And it starts going so fast that it gets superheated, it turns red, and it forms its own supersonic barrier in front of it with these effects. It goes past your screen. At this point, it's just straight up Yutaka Nakamura. Toto just snaps himself in. Yamaso Collection is just working beautifully. Look at the shading animation, man. Toto is not an easy character to draw. And to have his anatomy defined by different types of shadows, for individual frames. Incredible. Once again, exceptional animation work, but what shines is truly the drawing work by Yamaso. Todo being schizophrenic is the best thing about all of these episodes. The muscles are just so well-defined over here. Gosh, it's so good. Classic Utopon technique, take the character past your screen very quickly, 
and then hold him over there. Again, with the way the smears are closing in on Mahito right now, there's nothing, right? But then the smears from top and bottom closing in on Mahito, engulfing him in the smears, that is such a Ute upon pilled cut. It reminds me so much of this cut. I'll show it to you in slow motion so that it registers. The close up on Mahito's face again, heavily off model, but animated so well. And all of these drawings, again, Shaizo Todo, some of this is real, like right there, that's his master. This really did happen as we know, and this, this did not happen, but hey, now Todo is just using the power of ass in bikini, Yuji being part of Toto's class even though he is not a third year and he's not part of Kyoto school. In fact this class makes no sense whatsoever like only Kamo here is a third year if I'm not mistaken. Amazing correction here. I I'm assuming uh, Yamaso once again. I don't exactly know what's happening over here. She has a gun. There's an impact frame, red impact frame so I'm guessing someone's getting shot. And then a very classic Fujimoto-esque impact frame over here. You gotta have Fujimoto-esque impact frames and a black flash. Just a classic Utapon style lightning over here. Love how his face looks. He's just so fucking masculine. It's a still frame with the characters. Just letting the effects do their thing. Kind of anticlimactic that it did nothing. But of course, the point is that Toto is now fully ready, right? He has that essence of that curse energy now. Love the perspective drawing over here. It does not get more manga accurate than this. This is literally just taking the manga art and elevating that. The manga has simplistic designs and I always prefer simplistic designs in anime, but drawn really well. I love it when you appreciate designs, not because of the sheer level of detail put into it, but because of the sheer skill displayed by the draftsmanship, even though the character designs themselves are pretty simple. Now we're getting to that Mephisto sequence that I was talking about earlier. This is absolutely outstanding. In, in my opinion, it's Mephisto's best work ever. While I did just say that having simplistic looking designs drafted to perfection is my jam, that does not mean that I cannot appreciate when incredibly detailed designs are moved to this extent. And yeah, this is just next level of detail. Looking at the layout for this, a lot of the detail does come from Mephisto's Elo, but it is still highly incomplete. I don't know if he did second key animation or if there were multiple animation directors involved for this, but whoever did the correction for this, whoever made it look this detailed, really did an incredible job. Cause yeah, the sheer level of line work here is exceptional. I would even guess that this is like no credit Hironori Tanaka before I would have guessed that it was a young animator like Mephisto because that's how detailed this is. It does look quite a bit like Tanaka's work as well. Like look at Todo's face over here. Looks very much like Tanaka shading and Tanaka line work. Look at the sheer quantity of line work in Mahito's hair over here. Look at how well defined it is and how bouncy it is. Even for a still flame like this, look at the detail on Yuji. Look at the detail on Toto's back. It works as a wallpaper with the shot of Mahito here as well. Love the anticipation over here as well. Hold that and then clap. Hold that again. Once again, the sheer level of detail here is unprecedented. I don't understand how this has this much detail. This cut is just another level of craziness. All of the transfigured humans as well. It is not even loop. There's some level of looping involved, but every single frame also has something unique happening. Like more of these transfigured humans popping up or Mahito's hair constantly flapping. Look at the detail in that hair, man. Reminds me so much of that Tanaka scene from Chainsaw Man. This is one of the most detailed cuts of fluid animation in the entirety of Jujutsu Kaisen. Love this cut once again. And it feels like a cross of Tanaka and Keisuro Watanabe animation. And again, look at the build up and release over here. The timing is just so good. Of course, you have to make everything connect with the viewer as much as possible. So have one of the transfigured humans pop up here and then interact directly with the camera. And there's so much rubble, so much effects and so much smoke animation. The sheer level of effects here is so good. Again, here it is a looped animation, but there's still so much animation here. And the drawings themselves are also so good. This fight, I have to say, I forgot to say that. Yuji vs. Maito is one of the best fights in anime. It's a very old school-esque fight, especially in like Jujutsu Kaisen, where fights usually last half an episode, maybe less than that. And it really is kept fresh from start to finish. And now we are ground level once again. Amazing fight writing from Akutami Gege's side. Some more incredible character acting animation there on Maito, just to end off the episode. And then we get this shot, which I think is an Akita correction. What can I even say about this, man? It is so fucking good. The initial idea did come from Yuji Tokuno. And yeah, that is the end of that episode. But that's not it, of course, because we got one more episode to go. God, this video is going to be so long. But hey, it's my first video of the year. Maximum effort. So as to not make this video incredibly long, I'm not going to focus on the negatives because I've already mentioned all of them in the initial portion of this video. I do want to talk about the textures here, though. Very weird. Very season one-esque. They remind me of the road colors from the last episode of season one. We do get some outstanding bits of animation over here. It's not focused on like build up and release or anything. It's just focused on having a really nice flow. Just look at that. The way it's forming like a swirl. If that was a Canada style animation, it would like form a circular shape like this, then come in like this powerfully and then shoot up the swirl. Instead, 
it's flowing really nicely upwards. Here, there is a quite a bit of anticipation. This portion, it's like tightening up. It's about to explode. And you're holding that for quite a bit of frames. I'm skipping individual frames. And then releasing that. What an amazing correction, man. Uh, I'm assuming Yosuke Ajima, because who else draws Yuji this well? Now we get to this cut. This is animated by uh, Takahiro Watabe, one of the most important animators in this episode. So now every episode has their stars in terms of animation. Just like episode 19 had Yoto and Kosuke Kato. Episode 20 had Hayato Kurosawa and Mephisto and now this episode has Takahiro Watabe and B.S. Kim. Notice how I'm not necessarily naming the highlight animators. In episode 19, yes, Kato and uh, Yoto were the highlight animators. But in episode 20, Mephisto and Hayato Kurosaki were necessarily the highlight animators, those would be Shota Kojizono and Light On. But Mephisto and Kurosaki filled in the niche of chipping in with consistently high quality animation throughout the episode. It was not just like they did one big cut and then never appeared. Mephisto animated like a highlight sequence on top of multiple other sequences in that episode. And Hayato Kurosaki pitched in with effects animation throughout the episode. He also animated in this episode. I don't know how he does it. Similarly, for this episode, we have Takahiro Watabe, who mainly focuses on the first half, and B.S. Kim, who appears in the first half and the second half. So a lot of Takahiro Watabe's animation falls into that uncanny valley. It is very much done in once, and it has a lot of volume, as you can see here. So all of that is done in once, and then he there's like a dolly zoom-esque shot, where he brings Maito's face close to the camera. Of course, the camera is over here, so everything else will warp around the camera. And it's exceptionally well done animation. Uh, the portions here are animated by Nezar Al-Sabag. Might have butchered your name. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna call you Nezar. Nezar also animated the beginning segment over here. So I remember Nezar from his scene from Boruto. He animated a pretty cool hand-to-hand uh, -hand choreography cut, and now he's animating a very well-polished, fluid cut like this one. And also continuing here with a mostly good cut of Todo, another young animator with unlimited potential. They are just popping up randomly at this point. I love how he just rips off his head over here. And this is just so weird to look at. Starting from here is another Takahiro Watabe sequence. The timing here is incredibly satisfying. It's not necessarily incredibly fluid or anything. He's wrapped all the whips around him and then yeah, that release. It's so satisfying. He's animating how many characters are moving independently. We just do this wipe and Mahito's back on his feet. So cool. Complete black screen and then his hands just creep into the camera. Look at the volume. So well drawn. It's so beautiful. One of the highlight cuts of this episode. The shading on the curse as well. Gosh, it's so good. It is like done in once. Yeah, fully done in once. Yeah, just look at this way, this cursed band just stretching and morphing. It's so good. Animation here done by Iki. It is an extraordinary work of art. You wouldn't really expect a style like this to be randomly thrown into an episode of a show like Jujutsu Kaisen. The closest thing that I can think of is like Mio Sato's paint on glass and sand on glass animation from Mob Psycho. Everything moving at all times and it must be such a pain to animate with ink with such level of precision. Love the anticipation with every single scene as well. Slow motion. Fast motion, slow motion, that's really it. The continuous shift between slow and fast motions. It makes it feel like the curses over here, look at them. It feels like they are pulsating. Iki also did animate in the Eve music video. Same styles used there. Another very obvious Yosuke Ajima correction. Look at that anatomy. So good. The obliques so well defined. The hands so well drawn. Now coming to Shota Gojizono's art. Self-made 3D background over here. The textures, everything here might be uh, modified using hand-drawn animation, but this does have a 3D base. Animating with incredibly complex perspectives. This is classic Gosso animation. It's not as finished as you would expect from Gosso, of course, considering the schedule, but he's not doing something incredibly experimental like he did in the previous episode, but this is more like classic Gosso. Love how he's playing with perspectives. Yeah, look at that. So good. This is also incredible. Keeping Toto's position consistent, doing the clap, and then completely changing everything. Gives us enough time to realize what happened as well because of the slow motion. So the clap happens. Yuji is behind the Mantis curse. Toto is in front of it. Clap happens. Who is in front of the Mantis curse right now? That's right, it's Mahito. So Toto switched places with Mahito. Mahito, for some reason here, gets his shirt back. These are the kind of mistakes that is normal to see even in healthy shows. But in a show like Jujutsu Kaisen, it's especially common to see mistakes like these. Goes back to being shirtless because yeah, he's supposed to be shirtless over there. Uh, effects here, I'm assuming Hayata Kurosaki. Again, the textures on the building, the colors. I don't know whose decision this was. This is a very cool scene. He infuses the hanger with his cursed energy. Love the fluid rotation as well. Is there a 3D background? Yeah, this is entirely done in 3D background. Another quirk that this director has, he loves using 3D backgrounds, but it's, it's really flawless. Integration of 3D, 2D in this stage of the production, not easy. We see two more of those, but we just skip over that fight. It's classic Jujutsu Kaisen pacing. It's sometimes kind of awkward. That kind of weird pacing is part of Jujutsu Kaisen's identity, I would say. It, it's part of its charm. There are other manga that's trying to emulate that, like Kagurabachi, for example, is going with that breakneck pacing that Jujutsu Kaisen is known for, but it does not really work as well as Jujutsu Kaisen. More cool morphing animation here. 
I especially love how when Mahito absorbs all of that, he also absorbs his clothes back. This is far more Kanada-esque in terms of timing over here. Yeah, uh, in including the speed lines, right? Yeah, look at those uh, black speed lines. Very Kanada-esque. It is animated by B.S. Kim. He does not necessarily animate in a Kanada style. He animates in a very fluid style, as you can see over here. Gosh, that's so fluid. Animating so many different blobs moving in completely different directions. Love the way Yuji's flying past your screen over there. These drawings again are so incredible. I'm assuming still Yusuke Hajima. This cut is another one of the highlights of this episode. Yeah, that feels very much like hero animation. At the end over here, there's slow motion once again to make us understand what the fuck's going on. Love the poses on Yuji here. I love that open body pose right there. That's some really great foreshortening, especially where Yuji throws that as well. Look at the way the palm is placed on the billboard and the throw as well. So smooth. Also with this cut, Jujutsu Kaisen is now officially a Jojo reference. Again, Yuji just jumping around the vines like parkour is so good. I guess he does like using Kanada esque lines with poses and he consistently uses that. Extremely good animator, man. The last time he got the opportunity to animate in Jujutsu Kaisen, it did not really go well. His cuts were still the highlight of that episode, so it might have been the director's corrections that made his scene flow really poorly over there. But here, the episode director is not sabotaging his work whatsoever. It flows really well. The sudden expression change of Mahito as well, it's like so Mahito. The individual drawings here are so well done. We see a good bit of background animation over here. He goes face first. That, that should break his neck and kill him but i guess that's fine really nice background animation i also like the way the background looks over here i wish this is how it looked even in the art direction i don't even need textures just add a secondary layer of shading and add some items popping up here and there that's it like there's such a stark difference between this and this man the drawings are always so good how much work did yosuke ajima do on this episode the last episode he worked on was quite a few episodes back i think episode 17 so he's just been cooking on this one starting from here is the work of takafumi mitani so we've gotten i think three different representations of Mahito's domain expansion. There's the first and the OG one by Kai Shibata. Then we got Shinzuko Kozuma's version and now we have Takafumi Mitani's version. My favorite one still has to be Kai Shibata's version. All of them look amazing though. Couple of impact frames over here ghosted so I can't really tell what's happening in those and the way his fingers are forming here is so good. Takafumi Mitani is incredibly good with body horror. This is just the perfect scene for him to animate. And then the tiny hands coming out of his mouth and then forming the symbols as well. So good. It's coming deep from within his throat. As you can see the throat bulge over here. That is hands coming out of his throat. Again over here I'm assuming there's some tool assisted in betweening going because of yeah look at that. You see the banding over here that is the kind of shit that you would get from tool assisted in between. That does not look nice whatsoever. It actually does look like proper interpolation gone wrong but that's that's it. Everything else with this rotation looks great. It's just that the beginning portion over here that that looks very awkward. That is like one step ahead of even melting. A lot of people have been uh, complaining about this shot that Toto looks thin over here. That's not true whatsoever. Toto is just as buff here as he always is. Uh, I guess the illusion of thinness just comes from his bicep over here. It looks like this is it, right? That's where the bicep border is when actually it is this. He looks thin because of this perspective combined with the shadow over here making his arm look kind of small if you give in to the illusion that this is where his bicep is when it actually is over here. And this is where his front delt is, not over here. Move to Itadori. Gosh, the CGI work is so good in this episode. At least the idea is amazing, is what I'm trying to say. Because while the execution sometimes does fail, the idea is still perfect. It's not like fucking go hands. These are all Yosuke Ajima corrections again. Some more of Iki's animation. I love this. Ooh, I mean, look at the line work here. This is so rich. Ridiculous. Fully animated as well. That must have taken so much time. There's an amazing impact frame over here as well. So this clearly is Sukuna and his face is like split. This is like the curse Sukuna that we've seen in like Eve openings I think and sometimes in Jujutsu Kaisen imagery as well. And this is like Sukuna part of Yuji. Looks like both of those faces merged into one. Really cool impact frame. Some more inky goodness with these eyes. Amazing morphing animation there. Yuji's main issue is that he always looks away. He's looked away so many fucking times like an idiot. Faces here, uh, off model. Let's just move past that. Not particularly impressive black flash in terms of the animation. But what's really cool is that the flashing in of the bat to show that the metamorphosis is truly completed right now or it's in almost completed. Again, a shot like this, I just don't know how you would even think of doing something like this when the shade is this bad. It does melt quite a bit. As you can see on Toad over here, yeah, as we go through the frames, it's like completely inconsistent with a lot of, lot of melting, but that's something that would not be noticed by 99% of the viewers, so it doesn't matter. Now we get to the schizophrenia part two. Starting with this Yamaso correction, it does something to me. Takara-chan in particular, she's never looked this pretty. I mean, everything here is just so fucking over the top goofy absolutely love it and at the kick over here that is the most chun li pose ever and this cut yes one of the main animators 
Kosuke Kato just coming in, doing this shit. All these ideas are mostly by uh, Hone Hone, by the way, that is Sota Shigetsugu. He also pitched in the idea for the Shaizo Todo scene from the previous episode. I guess Hone Hone just loves Todo. And then Todo just randomly has a high school girl uniform on. I also think that this is directly animated by Hone Hone, by the way. And then this is just so damn good. Extremely fluid piece of animation. But yeah, that's it. A very cool, unexpected highlight. One of my favorite things in the show. Todo disappears in a streak of light and then the silhouettes with the line actually transforms. Right now it's Todo's silhouette, right? It fades away a little bit, but then that silhouette transforms into this. So what is this? That's a fist, that's a head, that's a body, that's another fist, and these are legs. That is transforming into Yuji's silhouette. Yeah, that is just so cool. The way the cursed energy Toto silhouette transforms into Yuji's silhouette. Then it disappears. And then Yuji finally does appear with, again, the same kind of line art silhouette, a cool looking impact frame. And then, yeah, he's back. I mean, look at the correction for this. I really want to know who did this because yeah, that is exceptionally well detailed. I love the textures being used as well over here. That's not the animation side. The animation side is just about drawing out the burnt areas and the skin sticking out. But yeah, the art direction also working really well over here. The cuts here are animated by Naoya Morotomi and it's just some incredible character and morphing animation. Mostly morphing animation. <laughs> or uh, unless you consider that to be Mahito's character. In that case, I guess it would be character acting. Use uh, UG as the transitioning device there once again. Or well, the wiping device, I should say. There's no transitioning, it's just wiping. Just look at that Yosuke Hajima correction. Gosh, that is so powerful. Uh, there's quite a bit of uh, jank in this animation over here. So I'm not gonna, just gonna skip past most of it. We do get to some amazing uh, dynamic animation here once again. And lo and behold, it's BS Kim once again. When named animators are working, it usually does end up better than uh, artists are known in these specific occasions. A really nice light flare there as well. Looks very Canada-esque. Uh, amazing transition there as well. While mostly the storyboards here don't feel very dynamic whatsoever, it's just going from one object that is moving to the next object that is moving all zoomed in, which is the least immersive way of doing this fight. You want a zoomed out view of exactly what's happening, but that requires time and effort with the choreography. Time is something that they don't have and they already are having to put in maximum effort to animate even basic storyboards. So that's just the unfortunate condition of this one episode, at least this portion of that episode, because the first half is mostly amazing. In the second half, most of the drawings are still here, but some of the fluidity in the animation is gone. As soon as I say that, we do get to the clear sequence, which is of course incredibly fluid, starting with really cool bit of background animation. The drawings don't look very nice, definitely not on par with Kiro standards. Compositing artists and art directors generally do have a hard time keeping up with Kiro's animation, but this is just taken to the next level. This one cut though over here looks really great. It reminds me of the Sukuna vs Gojo scene from episode 2. But over here, yeah, that's not enough keyframes and it's looped. You see that random barrage, then there's a pause, and then there's that random barrage once again. It's not very good choreography and mediocre animation by Keisuro Watanabe standards expected from the schedule. Most of this is again just choppy and not the best, not very dynamic whatsoever. But then with the smash, we finally get some awesome effects animation. Hayato Kurosaki made a lot of corrections to the effects in the segment, which is why the effects at the very least look amazing. Great drawing. I don't know if it's a Yosuke Ajima correction. Great impact frames to show the cracking of Mahito's exoskeleton. Pretty cool layout, but it's mostly the same layout in the manga as well, I think. And I love this, the Hunter Hunter reference. We saw that in episode 14 as well with the Nanami Punch. Effects animation. Look at that. Look at how gorgeous that is. Water bubbles, water ripples, a lot of debris and dust as well because the area where the two characters are fighting, there is no water over there. Look at that, that's straight up wallpaper worthy. More cool shots with Yuji. Some really good slow background animation here. That is just uncanny valley once again with how fluid it is. Let's just skip to the Kaito Tomioka scene. So the comp immediately gets an uplift. That is really good compositing right there. Especially look at Mahito's eyeball over here. That is so beautiful. Inside his iris, you do see Yuji and the punch comes in. Gorgeous impact frames transitioning to boom. It's refreshing to see non-Koki Fujimoto-esque impact frames used for a black flash. I guess Kaito Tomioka wanted to do his own thing and he did do his own thing. Of course, his own thing being any kind of animation just going in arcs. It feels like a still frame, but everything is moving over here. Uh, Yuji's hair is moving and there's so much line work. It reminds me of like the Shu Sugita finale scenes that he does for My Hero Academia, but the direct clear-cut inspiration comes from Hisashi Mori. The Hisashi punch, a punch connecting, an extremely long hold with the build-up. And here again, just look at this build-up. The punch is already connected. All of these frames are just Yuji going from this motion 
to this motion, to go from this to this, there are these many frames of build up. He must have spent so much time just drawing lines. Absurd workload. I like how heavily stylized these designs look as well. They don't look anything like Sayaka Koizo's designs. And yeah, Yuji at the end here goes full on guts mode. Really charcoal esque impact frames once again. FX animation in arcs. Kaito do make a special. Just the sheer quantity of effects here. That's like Nozomu Abe level. That is ridiculous. How many layers of FX animation? Yeah, that's way too many to count. Once again, these scenes carried by Sota Yamazaki's extraordinary corrections. Look at the way the injury is drawn. That is a classic Sota Yamazaki pose. I call it the return to monkey pose. Basically, the shoulders are really wide, tilted to the side a bit, and their legs are also tilted and aligned in an appropriate way. And yeah, another straight up just manga upgrade panel. One of the things that Sota Yamazaki does so well. I'm thinking about what Jujutsu Kaisen season 2 would have been like if Yamaso wasn't part of it. Let's just say the drawings wouldn't be as good. We get to the Shochi sequence now. So this is Shochi from start to finish, just multiple different stages of redraws. I'd assume there's assistance coming from second key animators and such because there needs to be assistance at this stage of the production. But at every single stage, Shochi has made her own adjustments. And this is what I was talking about, simple character designs. But I don't think anyone in the right mind would look at this and say that it's a bad drawing just because it is a simple art style. Shochi is displaying here an incredibly high level of draftsmanship, even with the simplistic designs, which is what makes it so appealing to me. Some really awesome character acting here and an amazing way to transition between Mahito throwing the snowballs and the dirt. If Yuji had just finished the job, it would have been much easier for the sorcery side of things to deal with everything else. I guess if Yuji did kill Mahito, Geto would just have to wait for another few centuries till a new Mahito is born and then steal his technique. The draftsmanship here is so beautiful. And now just for this one cut, it completely changes style. I wonder who did this. That's a correction I've never seen in Jujutsu Kaisen. This is still Shochi, I would assume. And here again, it almost looks like Western animation style designs. So yeah, that's it. Those were the last few highlight episodes of Jujutsu Kaisen season two. The final episode is also amazing, but I wouldn't say impressive in an animation side of things. It's more like the direction being so good by Shoto Kuchisono that it looks so good. I might talk about it a little bit in the production health video, which is the next video that I'm gonna make after this. Overall it's still shocking that something of this level of quality can exist in a production this bad. Yes, you can see the shortcoming. It is possible to see that it's not fully polished. But for the vast majority of people, especially the ones I've seen in Reddit forums, for them episode 21 is the best animated episode in all of Jujutsu Kaisen. While I don't agree with that, objectively that's a wrong statement. But the fact is that the episode is so good that just having recency bias and content bias on its side can take it from a great episode to an amazing episode. I can't wait to see more of these artists. Uh, now Kimejima might participate in Fate Strange Fake and also extremely excited for what Yuji Tokuno will do next because he was the most surprising discovery for me. But yeah, that's about it. If you reached this far into this video, thank you. Thank you for sticking around. Thank you for making it to the end of this video. My life has been a little bit of a mess lately, but I can always turn to content creation to make myself feel like yeah, I'm doing something of value. And the only reason I can think of this as something that has value is because it's given value by you guys, which is part of the whole reason I'm doing this. And I'm incredibly grateful that I have this community. So yeah, if you like this video, leave a like. If you did not like this video, leave a dislike, subscribe and share, spread the love. And that's about it. Thanks for the views.